on to the program. Each month, I will ask a current member to introduce our speaker. This month is Stan Kitson. He's been a member since 2013 and is the owner of Kitson Mar Marketing. Stan was successful in organizing our club's two interact clubs at East and Memorial High Schools. If any of our guests are interested in learning more about these clubs, Stan is the man to talk to. Please welcome Stan to the podium. Thank you, President Donna. Isn't this a great day to be a Rotarian? Or a kid of a Rotarian? I'd say so. Hey, welcome everybody uh, to our meeting today. We have a very special presentation from Bassam Shakashiri, Professor Shakashiri, who is going to prove to us that science is fun. Uh, just a little bit of background though. Bassam is well known internationally for promoting excellence in science education. Uh, he's a native of Lebanon and joined the faculty of the UW-Madison back in 1970, where he is now a professor in chemistry. He has given over 1,400 invited lectures and presentations around the world, including North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Australia, and the Middle East. And today, we're going to add one more to his list as he turns our podium into his science lab. Bassam? I don't know where you are right oh, there you are. Just a moment. We want you to know that we are making a donation in your name to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund you. for your presentation today. Thank you. You can come on up. I want to remind everybody that if there is time, we are going to have questions. Uh, afterwards, please use the microphone so we can capture it on video. And now, let me welcome and join me in welcoming Bassam Shakashiri. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stan. Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be back at the downtown Rotary Club of Madison. Uh, it, we, we live in a very special community here. We would like all other communities in our country to be special. It's part of our mission as citizens, as responsible citizens of Madison, of the state of Wisconsin, of the United States, as citizens of the planet. I, I want to thank you for inviting me once again to be with you here. I, I, uh, I wonder, didn't I do it right the first time? <laughs> uh, it, it is really um, <clears throat> a special privilege for me because as you heard, I'm about to start my 48th year as a faculty member here. And this is, <laughs> I'm very proud of that. I remember clearly May 24th, 1974, when Judge Doyle swore me in along with others as citizens of the United States. It was a difficult time in our country, 1974. <clears throat> he said many things, but the one thing that he said that I remember clearly, and I live it, he said, enjoy your freedoms. The most precious the most precious thing we can think about being in the United States is freedom. I travel internationally quite a bit, and every time I come back to the United States, I go down on my knees <clears throat> and give thanks for being in the US. It is a privilege, and we want everyone in the country to enjoy that privilege. <clears throat> what I'm, I'm <clears throat> well, you came to see and participate in enjoying some experiments. So we're going to do some experiments. And I want to share with you some additional convictions about the importance of what we do. So the first experiment I'm going to do is to <clears throat> Um, I have to B 
be prepared for it. I have to put my gloves on because I'm going to pick up some dry ice, solid carbon dioxide. I want to put the dry ice in the cylinder like so, like so. And I arrange this in such a way so that different people can see what's going on. Is there anything interesting happening when I drop the dry ice into the cylinders? Do you see anything? Yeah, yeah what? What do you see? <laughs> what do you see? Do you see, you see color changes? You see bubbles? Those are carbon dioxide bubbles. They're coming from the sublimation of carbon dioxide. Solid carbon dioxide is at, at a temperature of minus 78 degrees Celsius. It's very cold. And I use the gloves to protect my hands from frostbite. <clears throat> I don't squeeze when I hold the dry ice. But dry ice changes from being a solid to a gas directly without melting. That's a process we call sublimation. Can you say sublimation? <laughs> sublimation is happening right now, but we can't see it. How come we can't see it? Because carbon dioxide gas is invisible. It's also odorless. We can't see it. It has no color, and it has no odor. And we can see the sublimation when we look at the cylinders where I dropped the dry ice, because in my hand, Sublimation is happening, but gas is mixing with gas. In the cylinder, gas is mixing with liquid. So carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. I'm going to say a few things about greenhouse gases and such related uh, topics in the, in the very precious time that is uh, allotted to me. And I really want to thank you for coming uh, today to to the Rotary Club. So the title of my talk is Science is Fun and the Joy of Learning. Science is fun and the joy of learning. I ask you what you think about these words. They're very important words to me. Otherwise, I would not use them in my title. <laughs> and I have the great privilege of being the first holder of the William T. Evu Distinguished Chair for the Wisconsin Idea. William T. Evu died the year I arrived in Madison. I heard him on the radio. I heard recordings on the radio and um, ideas. And the advocacy that he had made an impression on me. So it's a privilege for me to be holding this chair since it was established in the year 2001. <clears throat> I'd like to share with you just by way of Focusing on why we do science and why we do science experiments. We face grand challenges in science and in society. The biggest question is how to help sustain Earth and its people in the face of what you see listed on the slide there. Population growth. I'm going to ask you to think what you were doing four and a half days ago as a time marker. Don't tell me what you're doing. <laughs> Just think about it as a time marker, because in the past four and a half days, the net increase in the world's population has been one million people. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Maybe some of you did. <laughs> and to put that number in better perspective, if you do the arithmetic on an annual basis, that's approximately 80 million people, 80, 80 million people is the net increase in the world's population. That's the approximate population of Germany and the approximate population of Egypt, two very different countries. <clears throat> we have finite resources that we must deal with <clears throat> and be aware of. And when I talk about finite resources, I am not talking about the rare earths that are in your electronic devices. I'm talking about Water. around the globe today. There are 1.3 billion people who cannot do what I am about to do. 
Some of them are in the United States. Some are in Wisconsin. It is an awesome responsibility that we have in dealing with those kinds of challenges. Malnutrition, spreading disease, deadly violence, war, climate change. Already alluded to greenhouse gases. But to me, the most important entry on that slide is the very last one, which is the denial of basic human rights, especially the right to benefit from scientific and technological progress. We live in the most advanced society in history. Everything that you can think of is the result of advances in science and technology. Everything, including the not so good things. That's why we need to be conscious and we need to be responsible in our action locally and globally. <clears throat> so this is the big context for why we must engage in thoughtful, responsible explorations of the mind, which is what researchers and science do, but also in sharing the benefits of those explorations with citizens at large. This is what the Wisconsin idea is about. We all know about the Wisconsin idea. We know about the history of the Wisconsin idea. What I ask you to think about is the Wisconsin idea for the 21st century. Not the Wisconsin idea that we're proud of, but the one that we want ourselves and our children and grandchildren to be proud of. That's the one I ask you to think about. <clears throat> the very familiar plaque on the side of Bascom Hall exemplifies the great traditions that we have here. And what we must do is glance in the rear view mirror, but look ahead. Don't stare in the rear view, rear view mirror. You know what will happen if you're driving and you stare in the rear view mirror. We want to look ahead. So I want to make a comment about labels. I'm a subscriber to what this plaque says. And this plaque is over a century old. Does that make me a conservative? Does, does that make me a conservative? What about the denial of basic human rights, especially the right to benefit from scientific and technological progress? Does that make me liberal or progressive? Think about those labels that we deal with and think how we can use them successfully. What is important in what we do, and this is what I would like to do this afternoon, and this is what I've dedicated my life to, is improved connectivity. Improved connectivity. And if anything can be said about the Wisconsin idea, about the failure of the Wisconsin idea, is the lack of sufficient connectivity between the University of Wisconsin and the citizens of Wisconsin. And that's what I'm working very hard to do something about. In all of our conversations with each other, we should remember these important human elements, respect, trust, and confidence. Respect, trust, and confidence. President Lincoln said it better than anyone else that I know about the importance of proper connectivity. He said, public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. You think back about our political situation in our country in the past year, past five years, the past 10 years, and remember what President Lincoln said. I share with you very briefly the mission statement of my research and development group. My, this is what I do research on, and this is what my outreach and public engagement is all about. The mission of the Wisconsin Initiative for Science Literacy is to promote literacy in science, math, and technology among the general public and to attract future generations to careers and research, teaching, and public service. We aim to foster community appreciation of science because science literacy enlightens, enables people to make informed choices, 
to be skeptical, to reject shams, unproven conjecture, and to avoid being bamboozled when making foolish decisions where matters of science and technology are concerned. Am I being too open with you? <laughs> science literacy is for everyone, scientists, artists, humanists, all professionals, the general public, youth, and adults alike. This is why, <clears throat> thanks to a generous donation from an alum from UW Madison, a non-science alum, we are able to secure this uh, vehicle, the Science in Motion program, and its aim is to foster community appreciation in science. It's parked in the parking lot right outside the hotel here. You want to take a look at it. <clears throat> And I want to thank the donor. I want to thank the university also for coming up with partial matching for doing these kinds of activities. We aim to go to within a 500 mile radius from Madison to make successful visits. And perhaps after I finish with the demonstrations here, perhaps you would encourage other Rotary clubs within a 500 mile um, uh, distance from Madison to um, possibly invite us to do what you're about to see here. All right, <clears throat> very briefly, the strongest forces in society today are religion and science. It's not just today, you think about it. <clears throat> and I wanna use two examples to make a point as clearly and forcefully as I know how. The one from evolution and the one about climate change. If between now and the time I die, which I hope is way into the future, I do not succeed in having intelligent conversations with my neighbors about evolution, that would be a very disappointing and sad situation. If between now and the time I die, I do not have success in having intelligent conversation with my neighbors about climate change, the consequences can be catastrophic to the believer and to the non-believer. And that's why I share with you in this little, <clears throat> uh, in the two sheets of paper here, some information about global warming. And I say to you that global warming is unequivocal. So now people ask me, I say, Bassem, why do you do science presentations. You know why I do science presentations? Look at each face in that picture. It is my favorite professional photograph. It was taken at Hilldale Shopping Mall during a presentation that I and my group were making. Look at every kid in that picture where we have, as we do in the audience today, kids of all ages. That's why we do science presentations, so that we are successful in engaging our community to be doing meaningful experiments. So one of our favorite students is, who's one of our favorite students? Bucky Badger. Bucky Badger is doing this experiment that I'm doing here. This is an experiment where I take an empty glass container it's empty except for air, so it's not fully empty. And I put in it a clear and colorless liquid. And then that's enough. And then I take another clear and colorless liquid. It's one of my favorite experiments because a clear and colorless liquid, I add another clear and colorless liquid to it and look what happens. Isn't that fascinating? Bucky Badger, Bucky Badger does this experiment every year. Bucky Badger's name, the name of our state, is related to the chemicals that I used in here. So the first chemical that I use is called potassium iodide, a clear and colorless solution of that. And the second one is a solution of lead nitrate. You know about the connections between the, 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 the badgers, our mascot, and lead mines. And if you don't, visit my website and learn about the meaningful connection that, that we have there. So that's one experiment that 
I wanted to do, but I want to come back and do uh, another, I want to repeat the experiments that I did with the dry ice in the, in the cylinder. So, so what, I, what I will do is take this bucket of dry ice and now watch carefully again where, what happens when I put the dry ice in the cylinders where the color, the original color, is still there. Are you making observations? Are you watching what's happening? Is, does, it, does, it, does it cause you to be interested in asking questions about this? And, and as you look at that, I now want to ask everybody that can see this, that can see this cylinder right here, which is part of the pair that I had before. And I know you can't see it very well there, so I'm going to hold it up and do the experiment by dropping a dry ice in there like so. And I want you to count out loud how many different color changes you see. You know what the overall color change is going to be because you've seen it before, right? So I add more dry ice. And are we there yet? No. Not quite. So we have to be patient when we do experiments. We have to be very patient and we have to pay attention. And we see something coming off the top here. It looks like smoke, but it's not smoke. It is actually condensed water vapor. It's fog. It's the same stuff that floats up in the, in the sky. That white stuff, what do we call that white stuff? Clouds, that's condensed water vapor. And what I want to show you now is taking a dishpan that's empty except for, I'm going to put the dishpan right here. I'm going to reach back and get a conical shaped glass container. It has in it boiling water. What do you see coming off the top? Steam is invisible. You can't see steam. What you're seeing is condensed water vapor. Look, in the, in the, in the wintertime when it's cold outside, and what do we do? We blow, we blow our breath on our, on our hand to warm it up. Don't tell me you're blowing off steam then, right? You're not doing that. You're seeing condensed water vapor. And what I'm going to do is reach for the bucket of dry ice that I have right here. And I'm going to dump in some dry ice like that. I'm still here. <laughs> we do these experiments because they are engaging, because they trigger in us. They trigger in us emotional reactions. I wish I had my phone here. Take a picture of the expressions that I see on all the faces. This is how they make fog in the movies sometimes. They take boiling water, add dry ice to it, and you notice that the condensed water vapor now is flowing downward. At the beginning of the experiment, the plume moved up, right? Now I'm going to tell you a very personal story about this experiment because it is also one of my favorite experiments. And what I always do it. One time I was at the Dane County Airport <coughs> trying to get <coughs> a boarding pass. And out of the corner of my left eye, I saw about 10 to 15 kids running fast toward me. And you know what they said to me? They didn't say, hi, Dr. Shakashiri. You know what they said? Condensed water vapor. <laughs> That's what they said. They were paying attention to this experiment. All right, carbon dioxide. Here's an experiment with carbonated beverages. I have a carbonated beverage in my left hand. And I have a baby bottle in my right hand. <laughs> that always generates this reaction. <laughs> I have replaced the nipple that has the hole in it where the milk flows out. I've replaced it with the rubber bulb from a medicine dropper. Could I take a, a, a five second time out here? Watch what these kids are doing over here. <laughs> you know what? That's what most of you, maybe all of you want to do. 
<laughs> okay, time out is over. <laughs> Back to this. This is a very strong piece of rubber. I'm going to try to show you how strong it is by blowing, attempting to blow air in it to see if I can inflate it. Here we go. <laughs> Can't do it. Very, very strong piece of rubber. Now, I take the carbonated beverage and I flip the top. You will hear a very familiar sound. You heard that, right? And then I take the baby bottle and I put the liquid in it. What do you see in the baby bottle? You see fizzing, right? You see bubbles. What kind of bubbles are those? Carbon dioxide bubbles. Where are they coming from? Is there any sublimation here? No. They're coming from the can that has the, carb the uh, carbonated beverage in it because the canning company, the bottling company, spent a lot of money compressing the carbon dioxide gas so it dissolves in the liquid. Now I put the screw cap on and I tighten it. What should I do after I tighten it? You've done this experiment before, huh? Okay. So I'm going to tighten it like this. And you said I should shake it, so let me shake it and see what happens. <laughs> now you have, in front of your eyes, you, have, you see how much carbonation there is in this um, carbonated beverage. The pressure of the gas is strong enough to inflate this piece of rubber that neither I nor any other human being can inflate with all the powers of our lungs. But you already know that carbonated beverages have so much carbon dioxide in them because after you take a sip or two, what do you do? You burp. And when you burp, please do it gently and politely. <laughs> right? That's because the carbon dioxide gas is coming out of the liquid. So now I'm going to lift this up and slowly release the pressure. Some of you want me to release the pressure fast because you'd like me to make a mess, but I'm respectful of the setting that we're in, and there it is. Now, you know that carbonated beverages, when they go flat, they don't taste as good, right? They're flat, that's because they don't have as, as much carbon dioxide, they don't have carbon dioxide in them anymore. So why do we like, why do we like carbonated beverages? Though well, they have sweeteners in them, some even have alcohol in them. You know, they have lots of bubbles in them. So when we put the drink in our mouth, the tiny gas bubbles come out of the liquid and tingle us under the tongue and give us a pleasant sensation. All right, so now I'm gonna ask you to focus your attention, <clears throat> including you, I'm gonna ask you to focus your attention on this large glass container that I have here. And to help you focus your attention over there, I'm gonna move this to the back. <laughs> All right, I have this glass, container and we'll take the lead iodide away. It's still here. And this large glass container has a volume of four liters. I'd like you to look at this right now. Because if you look at it right now, you just learned how big four liters is. And you cannot unlearn it. You may forget it. Ask my psychology friend over here. Learning and forgetting are not the same thing. This is empty except for air. I put it on top of a platform, turn the switch on, turn the light on, and then I take the, uh, whatever I took out, where did I put it, right here. I take a Teflon coated magnet, put it down here and turn the switch on. Can you see the bar spin? Those of you close enough, can you see the bar spin? I will tell you, as I look down at the bar, I see the bar spinning in this direction. Is that what we call clockwise or counterclockwise? The way this way. Now be careful, be careful. You know what? For safety reasons, it's a good idea if you, you'll see better from your, from your chair. And I, I can visit with you when we finish and we, I can answer all your questions. And then I can learn from your questions too. All right, so we look at this. Is it spinning clockwise or counterclockwise? Down, as you look down at it. This way is clockwise. Now I want everyone in the room to visualize the same bar spinning this way, except you, we're looking at it from below. In other words, visualize a ceiling fan up there. 
And tell me, when you look up, what do you see? <laughs> You're getting me confused. <laughs> Is this my right hand up here or left hand? And then when I put it down here, it's still my right hand. So what's going on? Here's what's going on. I want everyone in the room right now, everyone, to stick your finger out like this. And I want everyone, including me, to rotate in a clockwise direction. Hey, I said clockwise. What are you doing? I said clockwise. See, if I turn around like you are facing me now, I'm turning clockwise. I'm still clockwise. I'm still clockwise, but when I turn completely around, what do you see me doing? You get the point? <laughs> All right. So I'm going to take three clear and colorless liquids and mix them together in this large container. So here is the first one. It's not so clear. It's got some cloudiness to it now. I take the second one. And I add the second one. Anything interesting happened so far? It's well, the volume increased. That's that's very common. Maybe not so interesting. <laughs> and I and then I and then I increase the speed of the motor. Let's see. And now you begin to see what looks like a tornado. I hope this is the closest you can ever be. We will ever be to a tornado. And then I'm going to take the third one and add the third one. And what do you see happening? I see a yellow color. I add all of it. And what do you see now? A beautiful blue color. Is there anything interesting happening? No? I don't see anything happening. What? 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 What's going on? What? Tell me when to look. Should I look right now? Right this second? No. She said no. Okay, I won't look right now. I don't want to trip over anything here. Tell me when to look. Right now. You sure? I don't want to trip over anything. Every time I look, the color is blue, deep blue. I may, maybe you can help me better on this side. Okay? All right. All right. All right. You know what? That. Pay attention. Pay attention. Okay? When shall I look? When shall I look? Right now? You sure? It's dark blue. It's almost black every time I look at it. When? You tell me when. Right now? You sure? Right? Yes? 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 Well, what is it that you were doing that I was not doing? You were looking. I was looking. I was looking at you. And you were looking at the experiment. So if you, wanna, if you want to learn, you have to be focused and you have to learn. You have to learn how to make sense of what it is that you're seeing. But you have to be looking at it. So let's mix them again and see what happens here. Isn't this a beautiful set of color transformations that you see? Well, we can't see the tornado because of the dark color. So what I wanted to share with you is a set of experiments that I presented. But I want to invite you. Every time I look at the color, it's deep blue, right? All right. All right. Right now. Whoa, 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 whoa. OK. All right. This, this, uh, there it is. Beautiful color transformations. And this is one of my favorite experiments. <clears throat> For two reasons, it's one of my favorite experiments. The first one is that it was discovered by two high school teachers. It was discovered by two high school teachers. It's named after them. It's called the Briggs Rauscher reaction. Briggs and Rauscher taught high school chemistry and physics in Northern California. And in 1973, they published a paper describing this beautiful captivating behavior. The second reason it's special to me is that it took researchers, high-powered researchers, members of the National Academy of Sciences. It took them nine years to figure out what's going on here. <laughs> this is why we do public engagement, so that people ask questions and people deal with 
ways by which they can successfully answer those questions. I know I'm close to the time. President Donna, may I, may, President Donna, I have something special for you, President Donna. President Donna, here's the sciences fun button for you. That, wait, does that allow me one more minute? I want to tell you about my book. I wrote this book, Chemical Demonstrations. There's my name down here, but Sam Shakashiri. Stan got it, the pronunciation correct? That was good, right? And this is published by UW Press. It's volume five in a series of five volumes, beginning in 1983. Until today, it keeps the UW Press in the black. <laughs> yeah. I'm very proud of that. So for my closing exper experiment, I want to open this book and read the instructions. Is that OK if I did that? OK, P -p permit me to do that, right? So ooh. <laughs> you, you, can, you can see that this is not an ordinary, ordinary book. This is a hot book, right? <laughs> it's actually not a book at all. It's just the book covers. On the inside, I have batteries that have stored in them chemical energy. And I have a wick here that I soaked with lighter fluid when you were not looking. And there's a filament from a light bulb up here. And down here, there's a small button. Can you see the button? Yeah. Right? Right. So, so what happens is that when I push the button, the chemical energy stored in the batteries changes into electrical energy, and the filament lights up. But this filament that's in here, like the filament in all other light bulbs except LEDs, gives off light energy and heat. All right, so to do this experiment, the first thing I do is move the book away from my face. <laughs> I open the book. There's the button. I push the button. There you see, okay? Now, you tell me, you tell me out loud, what happens when I close the book? What happened when I close the book? Nothing. You know about the fire triangle. You need three things to have a fire. You need something that burns, oxygen usually from the air, and then a source of ignition, right? So some of you are like the students in my class, my large freshman chemistry class. You give a correct answer, but not to the question that I asked. <laughs> So the question I asked is, what happened when I closed the book? What, what happened when I closed the book is that the fire went out. Why did the fire go out? Because there was no more oxygen. All right, I opened the book now. Is there more oxygen or not? No. But there's no fire. How come? We need three things to have a fire. So what do I do? Move the book away from my face, right? <laughs> Push the button. We teach about the fire triangle to help people learn how to put out fires, not to start fires. And I want to close by thanking you for your commitment as exemplified by the opening slide that I paid attention to. And I want to thank you for over the years being leaders in our community to help the quality of life in our community. But I call on you to expand the scope of our community. It is very, very important that every segment in our community be benefiting from what the Downtown Rotary Club and its members can do. Every segment. Every segment in our community. Thank you very much.